We on here? Near me? Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming out here. Um, I, I got to say right off the bat that, like, there are so many homebrewers here that we had to kind of shift up the format that we usually do. Uh, we started doing this um, at the Northwest Pinball Show. Uh, our goal here is to show everybody here that people building pinball are just like the rest of us. We all like to kind of band together, create something cool, and share the journey with everybody else. So uh, my uh, partner in crime, uh, Ernie Silverberg, was going to come up, and we were going to banner a little bit back and forth um, and then get people to start coming up here. But... I think we just need to get started and bring some others and start talking about pinball. So um, I see Steve right in front of me. Can I make you my guinea pig? Will you come up and join me? Right on. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome. Testing, testing. And, I, and so uh, as some of you may have followed along, I drove out here uh, from like the, the northwest by way of Monterey, California, through Salt Lake City, and... Um, Steve was originally, it was sounded like you weren't going to be able to make it out due to yeah. time constraints, but I'm like, I'm literally driving through your backyard. Could I pick your game up without increase the likelihood that you'd come out here? And he's here. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Aaron saves the day once again. Shoot. Okay. So we're going to do this kind of rapid fire style. I mean, like I said, there's a lot of people here. We got like an hour ish or so to 45 minutes to fill. So tell us a little bit about your project. Which game down there can they come and see that you put your life, soul, Flesh, blood, everything into like share share your game. So I have the Led Zeppelin homebrew um, that's downstairs. I've got a YouTube channel that many of you know me from, where I've tried to document my process ish, and hopefully it didn't lead you straight too much for those of you who watched it. Uh, but yeah, so Led Zeppelin is kind of known for its primary mech is like a staircase escalator mech that I made that is really fun and worked out better than I thought. And yeah, that's my that's my game. I just realized I've yeah, got a slide deck that I can use to like trigger the next thing oh, to do okay. here, so that's awesome. Um, you know, so every, everybody kind of gets into pinball and with uh, from a different direction, a different idea, a different uh, different goal, a different skill to learn and stuff. You def you're definitely in the category of that one mech you wanted to have it exist that like was kind of a focal point in your game. So talk about the stairway. Yeah, so when I started out, I had done like a couple of custom MAME arcades with some buddies like 15 years ago. We thought that was a lot of fun. I always dreamed about doing like a pinball machine, but thought there's no way. Like I've seen underneath the play field, there's no way I can make something like that. And I had, so I'm taking a little bit of a tangent, but I'll be quick. I had a neighbor <laughs> who I found out was big in a pinball like 15 years ago. I'm like, dude, you got some pinball machines? I love, I haven't really played that much in a while. He invited me over. He's like, yeah, I like fix these for people and stuff and rent them out. I'm like, really? And can you teach me? And he, he did. He kind of demystified it. I'm like, you know, maybe I can do this. And I started looking around. I'm like, eh, maybe I can't. Um, there's a lot of things I don't know how to do. And then fast forward a number of years, I bought a machine, a getaway, then I sold it and things happened, whatever. I finally got back into it again, probably about 10 years ago with some machines, started a small route renting them and finally decided, you know what? I, I really want to try to do this. So I started looking around again. And that's when I found FAST. I found Mission Pinball Framework, which for me, those were like the two biggest obstacles. I'm not a coder, and I don't do anything with circuitry or circuit boards and, you know, machine-level communications. So I'm like, okay, with those things, maybe I can try this. Right. So then I started kicking around ideas and thinking of things, and a lot of people said, you should do a retheme first. It's way easier. And I said, I don't want to do a retheme. Of course. That's fine if you do, but I, don't, I, I, I wanted to really get in and try to make my own shots and stuff. And Anyway, and somebody said, well, do a music pin, because then you got music you can borrow, you got artwork you can borrow. I'm like, okay, because I'm not great at that stuff. So I decided to do a music pin. Figured no one's ever going to make a Led Zeppelin theme. I'll do Led Zeppelin. Yeah. And six, eight months later, <laughs> another Led Zeppelin came out. But by then, I was, I was already committed. I'm like, you know what? I'm doing this thing. And I had the idea for the escalator. I'm like, again, I'm not an engineer, but I'm like, I, I think this could work. I mean, I think about you like are an, an escalator. Now. I mean, at least, like, I mean, I mean that's, that's a real mechanism. It's a physical, uh, it, yeah, it's you're, a real experience. You're too kind. Yeah. It, it mostly works. So, yeah. But and, and like as Steve said too, he's got his pinball room, like YouTube channel and stuff. And I think it's been really cool. People come to shows and introduce themselves and say, "I got into and thought I would do pinball, uh, homebrew pinball because of your videos." So that's pretty fantastic. Yeah, it's really humbling. Yeah, it's. All right. Well, let's let's. Um, I, I've created the most elegant slide deck ever in the last like 10 minutes here. So um, we're just going to use whatever shows up next as a who who should come up next. Fun transition. And and I think that like I'm. I, I was trying to get everybody in. I might have missed some people. So if there's not a slide for you, it doesn't mean we don't want to talk to you. So, okay, let's do Oh, thank you. Nice. <laughs> All right, thank spin you so the much. wheel. Okay, Mike, Hi. come on down. <laughs> Got my launch party t-shirt on. Yeah. yeah. 
You know, I love that so many pinball projects now come with active wear, like different t-shirts, <laughs> like people are making hats and all that stuff. So it's not just the game we're making, but all the uh, attire to go with it. Okay, Overwatch. So uh, this is a game that you're kind of in that category where I used to feel like I knew every homebrew project all the time. Everything that was happening, bubbling up, yours all of a sudden showed up full fit and finish, and, and here's the game. So talk about this project and what you got you into homebrew pinball and, and Overwatch. Right, so so me and my sons are teenage boys now, um, really huge pinball fans last five years, right. games in and out of the house. Uh, Christmas two years ago, my younger son says, let's build a pinball machine. I'm like, no way, just like Steve. <laughs> uh, and then we watched a few YouTube videos of Steve and of uh, Jack Danger, and we were like, all right, maybe we can do this. Um, so, uh, and then we found Ernie Silverberg, Trident Pinball, mm -hmm. or on Pinside all the time. We're like, oh, there's a starter kit, and well, I think we can afford it. So um, that was that was how we started. And my son sketched it out in a notebook, and uh, we have a before and after picture of like day one, the page on the notebook, and then you know what it looks like today. So like the dream journal idea that started from the ideas, and then what it actually turned into. You've got it's literally art. crayons. You know, that, I, I think that's that's a common tie that we hear a lot because we all are busy, families, life, work, and stuff. And the idea of, like, finding others to rally with on a project, but a lot of us hope to get our kids involved, you know. And I think that, like, that's something that, you know, whether it's a chance to teach them some new skills, teach them how to use tools, or even just spend time together. I mean, that's something I'm hearing more and more, and I think that's a really cool thing. So your kids being involved in this process, like, are do they are they already bugging you to do the next project? Like, what's next for you and your family in Homebrew Pinball? Yeah, so um, my younger son wants to do another one. He, he would like to do Megadeth. He's a metalhead. Nice. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not formally announcing it yet, but we, we might do a Megadeth. Um, uh, they, they like different things. So my older son's real tech tech savvy. He okay. did a lot of the coding with me. Uh, he laid out the files in Adobe Illustrator, Adobe Photoshop. My younger son likes to work with his hands, so we glued the cabinet together. We spray painted, sanded, you know, stuck the decals on. So they like different aspects yeah. of it. And the cool thing was, like, on any given day, like, two of us were exhausted and didn't want to do anything at 6 p.m., yep. but one of us did. Yeah. And so we kind of pulled the, the rest of the group on, and, you know, and that, and that was just how we got it done kind of so quickly. Yeah, I mean, it popped um, up very quickly. And I think that, you know, talking about, like, you know, when you're hot, when you're hot, you're, when you're not, you're not. Like, you've got a team where, like, somebody else is kind of inspired to pull ahead and lead the charge where everybody else is recovering, you know? Right. I think that having that kind of camaraderie on a project is really good because, again, like, you have a long day at work and you want to get home and work on the homebrew project, you're like, you know, I'm not going to do it. But shoot, I'm meeting up this weekend with the guy writing the code, and if these mechs aren't plugged in, that's going to be really disappointing. We're going to lose weeks of time. That kind of accountability is really cool. And I have to imagine, like, in the house, you can't get away from it at all. No, you know? no. And my kids are coming tomorrow. My kids and wife, they had school. Cool. So they're flying in from Jersey. They didn't want to do the road trip with me, but... <laughs> Man, that's fantastic. You know, and it's so great to meet you, too. I mean, this is the first time we've been in the same place. Yeah, thanks so, for all your help cool. over the over the Discord and the Slack channels. I mean, couldn't have done it without the community. I mean, yeah. you know, it's just, like, amazing. So thank you, everyone. Very cool. Right on, cool. man. All right. Hey, do you have a big one? All right, let's spin the wheel and see what's next. Okay. Tattoo Mystique. Brian's not here. So the Tattoo Mystique game, that was one we dragged out. Uh, I'll tell a quick story on that. The, it was one of the first games that was actually running the Fast Pinball hardware and the Mission Pinball framework at a public show. This was a game that, like, he, re he took the original game and refactored it as if he made it fresh today. So go down there and check it out. It's super pretty. It's all done in like hand-drawn like sailor tattoo art style. So it's very, very cool. Next. Did I kaiju? Ron Anderson? All these? No? I was trying to track this guy down. I, I couldn't find him when I was like rallying everybody in the last 15 minutes to get up here. So uh, definitely go down and check out this game. It's got a really cool lower third. Um, I looked at it and I'm like, this is insane. But like the more I played it, it became another equal participant in the project, like a way to, different way to throw the ball around and um, a very cool thing. So definitely come down and check this one out. Right. Borderlands 2, Brian, come on down. <laughs> props, okay, now it's, we've got costumes, attire, hats, and props now. So there you go. <laughs> How's it going? Welcome. Thank you. Okay, so if you haven't walked by and check out the Borderlands game down here, this is one where you'll see it out of the corner of your eye, and you're like, what did I just see? And everyone's crowd around, they're filming this, and you're like, okay, filming somebody playing a game. But then you realize that the play field is moving all over the place. And this is something that, like, you know, I've heard people throw around this idea of, like, I'd love to move the play field around, but this one's actually doing it. This, this one's is, actually doing it, yeah. So talk about this. Talk so about your project. I've been going to Pintastic for, for many, many years. I'm out from Massachusetts, and every time I go... It's about like, oh, I, I want to build my own game. I want to do this. I want to do that. And the idea was to do a video game that I could make increasingly more difficult. 
by pitching the play field. And okay. I thought to myself, what's better than one actuator but three for three times the cost? <laughs> and so the idea was, well, if I could if I could pitch and roll it, you could do some really wild stuff. And right. the, the labyrinth game with the two knobs, yeah. uh, not the pinball, but the old school game, yeah. I was like, oh, like we could drive the ball around. And so that was sort of the advent of it where like, can we do this thing? Is it possible? I got some actuators. I stapled them to a piece of plywood. I literally set a cardboard box on top and just like put a ball in there with a with an airplane controller yeah. to see like can I can I even keep it on the on the box right will it stay there and I could and it's like okay well if I put a ramp on there and some cardboard targets can I drive it there and is it fun and so that was sort of the event so there was a lot that went into like is this feasible is it a gimmick right I wanted to make sure it was still a pinball machine right so when you play it unless you know the secret it just looks like a pinball machine and then you make a mode and the whole deck just drops, and you're like, everyone thinks they broke it. They they kind of they don't pay attention. <laughs> they miss the instructions on the screen for what they're supposed to do. Uh, but then the whole game starts moving around, and so I wanted to make sure it was still a pinball machine and mm -hmm. didn't lean on this gimmick of being the entire thing. So well, and I think that's really cool though, because I mean the idea of the gimmick. You know, we've all got the one technical thing we want to put into the game, but right away you said like I wanted to work it in to make a shot a little harder in the process. So it's not just like a show off of a cool piece of tech, but you're thinking of it already affecting the game. It's not just like shoot the shot more times. It's shoot the shot when it's tilted at a different angle. Yeah. That's incredible. So the the theme Borderlands is a game I've loved forever, and it, it really lends itself to the motion. The, the game is fun. It's sort of lighthearted, and there's a mode where you battle a monster, and there's an anti-jackpot shot, which if you hit it, he throws a car at you on the display and breaks your leg, and the whole play field leans. And so now you're stuck <laughs> battling this monster with a five-degree left lean, uh, but it also happens to make the one-hit kill shot a little easier if you know where to go. And so there's these sort of fun dynamics you can do um, where you've got this play field that introduces this new element. And then, like, you know, sometimes it's just the normal pinball machine where you shoot combo shots and that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's been fun. That was a lot of effort went into making that system as robust as it is at least now, uh, ensuring that we don't blow the play field through the glass. Uh, so there was this balancing act. Things you don't think about, your play field like mid-game yeah, going through the glass. Yeah, we did a lot of work on that because it, it turned out if you wanted the actuators to never be able to do that, you also didn't get very much control and it wasn't fun. Okay. And so we needed these massive throws of this game so you can really move it around, but it also introduces some risk. Well, and it's, it's, it's cool too, like standing back, like I, I, whenever we're at these events, I try to like stand back and grab pictures of people talking to people and playing their games and stuff. And it's, you know, everything we've done with the getting more of the homebrew games and the whole experience that Emoto put together down there, all the background, the backdrops and everything, it's made it this experience. So people kind of wander in the homebrew space and they're like, that's awesome. What am I looking at? And then end up crowding around and playing game after game. And I still haven't played your game. Oh man. Every time I've walked uh, by, I've sat there and watched you tell the story of how it works. And even the, like when you talked about the you know the the was it the crashed car and yeah then heard the, I'm yeah. like this is brilliant this it's is amazing fun. so I mean one quick question I mean this is a massive feat on top of just making a playfield how long did this take you I'm like I think all the hours involved so I had one friend that helped me provide the control system so I designed okay. the actuators he came down for Christmas and handed me a little box it was about yay big <laughs> and inside was an Arduino stack with three motor controllers and a thumb drive okay. And he said, we're going to get this running tonight. And so he had done about 300 hours worth of work for my Christmas present uh, because he oh, was he, he didn't have a lot going on at work, apparently, and he was bored. That's the story I got. <laughs> so so Craig Schaefer's my good buddy. He brought the code down and handed it to me. And, and he was right. We got that thing tilting in within a day. So now it's on you to make the work that he did for 300 hours, not focusing was, work into this. It was a lot of, yeah, that was the, okay, well, now I'm committed. Like, if I wasn't before, I was certainly committed to make it happen then. So I think man hours in, and it's like 1,200 hours or something Jeez. like that. Well, I mean, it's impressive. It's uh, like I said, like I kept trying to go and play it. I will get to play it before the weekend's over. I have to get up early tomorrow and come in and do it. If so. you're thinking about building a game, it doesn't have to take you 1,200 <laughs> hours. Just use three less actuators, and it'll be smoother sailing. Not smooth sailing, but smoother sailing. Dude, right on. Oh, well, thank thanks you. for coming thanks, down, guys. Yeah. yeah, thanks to everyone else's help. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Kyle Reed. So if you haven't gotten a chance to walk by and see Kyle's game down here, like I, I'm going to tell a quick story. I've seen a lot of people who set out to get into pinball and make pinball, and they start up in software modeling up this beautiful landscape with all these mythical shots that are certainly going to work, right? But um, 
it often fizzles out. When the realities of the real physical world kick in, those projects kind of get slower, kind of get backburnered, and they go nowhere. So when I'd first seen Kyle's project, it was a year or so ago, I think. Like it was like, wow, this is amazing. I want to see this happen. And then only like from the last couple months, checking back in and seeing the depth. And it's not just like, you know, a bunch of things on here that represent stuff. It, it's a very literal play field. There's a lot of depth to it. And even if you look at the, the, the play field itself and the cabinet, there's a lot of depth in there. So I've learned a lot about like, uh, you know, how much you know this property and all the things you'd want to do with it. But talk about like your journey with building the Harry Potter homebrew pinball machine. Well, I kind of started out wanting to do a game for, I don't know, years ago. But I remember watching Dead Flip streaming on his game design. And I'm like, man, this is kind of intriguing. I want to actually start pursuing this. And then I started going down that path, but I never actually really got physically into it until Pinball Room's videos. And the, got this like tag team like, of media content creators yeah, no, right like, here, you know? Yeah, team right there. <laughs> but like their videos are so like concisely edited to the point where it's like, all right, my brain can understand what the process is supposed to be, and then I can take it and run with it from there. So um, probably three years ago, I started actually designing this, and I started in VPX, kind of like Jack did, and getting a flow that I thought would shoot fun. And then I translated that out into Fusion 360 and began modeling the whole thing. And for everything that I wanted to do with this license, you can't do like a Harry Potter pin with like a little miniature castle. You can't do a Harry Potter pin with like one character and like only five shots, you know, for doing all seven years of the entire franchise and being able to incorporate everything that you want to into it. I wanted to go wide body and I wanted to go deep. And so I wanted to create that world under glass that everyone talks about. And so that's where I added the depth of the cabinet by putting in a full size sculpt of Hogwarts castle and a prophecy orb that has a projector behind it. Um, a Quidditch pitch that's actually a play field that raises up and down with a flipper that actuates and a spinner on it so that you can shoot the scoring rings at different heights. So I really wanted to be creative in a way and do something that hasn't been seen in pinball before, but do it in a way that really did the theme justice. I think that's one thing that every time I've heard you talk about this, you know, like my family, we've seen the Harry Potter movies every season. They're playing in the background all the time. And I felt like I knew all the aspects of it. But hearing the depth and the decisions that you made about, you know, things like the flu network and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that are going to be using things that we love about moving balls around in a pinball machine, but actually tie it really closely with the storyline. I mean, talk about that effect, that, that piece alone, because I think that's something. Yeah, cool. I mean, I'm really big about wanting to create moments in pinball. And so one of it, like you said, the flu network is actually I had to design a self-staging subway circuit that's all underneath the play field. Think like Star Trek Next Gen, except mm -hmm. you don't see it staging balls. It's doing it without you knowing. And there are three vertical up kickers that are all staged by the subway circuit. And when you shoot one, it automatically, instantaneously will shoot one out of the other two available kickers. And then meanwhile, it'll clear the staged ball from the one you shot, drop the one that you shot into it to stage it, and it all circulates through this whole circuit. So I want to be able to create like those magical moments. Or like I put in a magnet on a linear rail, think like Mist Multiball. It's like that, but I wanted to have it be like a wand battle, like you're dueling another uh, sorcerer or wizard. So the ball will be grabbed on this rail, and you're going to be in like this battle trying to push the spell back at the person who cast at you to defeat them and also incorporate like skill shots of some nature to right. learn spells things like that well i think that like because you've got that literal landscape that stage to tell all the story on i think mm -hmm. that like there's no end to the depth of the code that you can do on top of that once these yeah. characters are running around on there i'm i think it's gonna be fantastic and right now as you go through there it's like you're just at everything is all hooked up now yeah i mean two days before expo i didn't have it in a cabinet i didn't have wire forms so right. like i bought a mig welder last week so i could figure out how to weld wire forms <laughs> and i bought a topper for my truck so i could figure out how to get it here so you know <laughs> it's it's not a cheap hobby but but we're learning skills yeah, right yeah it's enriching our lives it's it's fun you know it's tinkering and Getting to see it come to life, it's going to be great over the next year, just getting the features baked in the way I want it to. Well, I think that's where, like, getting to these shows, like, you know, at the, at the I think it was, what, Texas show last time when we were, uh, we did a talk like this, talking about games and stuff, and at the end, Ernie interrupts the closing and goes, 
we want to make sure that when you come and check out the homebrew stuff that you're not intimidated by the fit and finish of a lot of these homebrew projects mm -hmm. and stuff. You know, it used to be a time where we're all dragging out our, you know, Home Depot plywood play fields and we're so happy that a flipper flips, you know. Yep. And now it's like, can you believe these games that are done by homebrew pinball creators and fans of pinball that look like real games? And so that's that's really incredible. And I think that just getting your game out here with the depth of it, that was a major milestone. And then oh, hopefully yeah. at the next time you bring it to a show, you're not changing out your PC in the morning before yeah, the, the show opens. Buying a laptop the day the yeah. show opens. Yeah. Good well, fun. dude, thanks for coming out, yeah. man. Dude, great thanks for having me. All right, you got next. Mark and City, come on down. <laughs> so... Mark is, uh, I mean, his Nightmare Before Christmas game is, is, is gorgeous. It's, it's beautiful. It's a great story on a play field done by a cool person who makes great stuff. Right? Who we talking right. about? Right, this guy. <laughs> but Thanks. Mark's definitely in the OG category. I mean, like, he's been doing this a long time. You know, and I think that a lot of us have seen his project and been like, I want to do what he did there, you know? And I think that in the earliest days, when we came to Pimble Expo, I mean, this is the 40th now. I think, was that the 30th? Or was it 10 years ago? Yeah. That, yeah, you had it there as Whitewood. Um, it was very cool because we were all trying to get there and trying to show that we had good games and they worked well and stuff, but everyone was stressed out because nobody's game was finished, nobody's game was polished the way that they had it in their mind. And what we found was that it was such a great chance for people to wander up curious, like, what is this corner here? And what I'd love to see was people coming up and playing your game because it was one of the richer homebrew games at that time and seeing, you know, George Gomez come up and play it and seeing everybody stand back and enjoy these real pinball you know, legends playing the games that are made by homebrew people. So talk to people about your first experience getting that to a show and where it's gone since then. Um, sure. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was a little bit nerve wracking uh, getting it to the first show. Um, I had just put it into the cabinet and I realized my, my cabinet was a little bit too wide. It was like I'd made a wide body, uh, but the person that made my cabinet made it a quarter inch too wide. So just, uh, yeah, just days before the show, just trying to get uh, glass that fit. So I had to get a custom piece of glass made and everything. So, um, but yeah, just then getting it here and then meeting everyone and uh, having everyone play it, like you said, it was so, so cool. Um, and getting that feedback. I remember um, some people telling me, it's like, oh yeah, this left switch is a little bit too tight compared to this other one. Just little, little bits of feedback like that were kind of cool. Um, and then, yeah, I, I had paper ramps for the first few years. Right. And people were surprised that this, like, was, was holding up. It was just pr uh, poster board with uh, duct tape. But it, it captured the flow. I, I knew how things were going to go and everything. And it's just, yeah, it was cool. It was when, just... you, when you talk about the feedback of the shows, too, I mean, like, on, on all the games it takes to get to the point to where we can flip and shoot the games and stuff, you're going to sit there and play the game the way that you know it, and it's going to work great. And then you get in front of the random public players playing it, and that ball's going to stick every place a ball could possibly stick. Everything exactly. That... Yeah, yeah. Like, well, just this show, I was just saying uh, to some people earlier, it's like the ball got stuck in about three or four different places on this show that had never happened. Like this show before. here today? Yeah, just just in the last couple <laughs> of days. There's like a, a, a tiny spot in the back underneath one of the loops and stuff, and it's like, yeah, the ball got stuck there. It's like a, that had never happened in like 10 years. Well, and I think so. that's the part about like getting it here. It's like you know, hearing the feedback, like you were saying, but also the the way people play a game. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people talking about how like something that they thought would be fun and enjoyable, maybe it doesn't translate to fun and enjoyable to the general public playing. If you know the game and that's a fun thing to shoot, but if you can't get to that fun shot, yeah. then it's not enjoyable. So I mean, for you and and in the process of of making this game, it's been to a lot of shows now, and I mean, getting it physically built and running. Um, as you've taken that that insight and guidance and applied that to software, like what kind of things did you add or change as far as your software end of things? Uh, I ended up shuffling some modes around. Okay. Uh, just uh, one thing I learned was that like you needed to have like some sort of something easy mm -hmm. uh, for people to get into it. So that's why there's a one of my first modes that you can get to. Uh, you knock the gate down and you go in there and you get a you get an instant two ball multi ball. Okay. And that's a lot of fun for people. It's like oh this excitement and everything. Yeah. It's not worth a lot of points or anything like that, but you have to give something fun, you know, to start off like that. Um yeah, I don't know. I, I would say too that like one thing that's been getting more and more popular with game code coming to these shows especially is like 
you know, when you lay out your grand plan for the game, like that's a slog to get to that final version of what you want. We've been seeing more people creating like they call it kind of a taster experience. Like like Mark was saying, like give me some stuff I'm going to shoot. I want to see what that thing does when I hit it. It doesn't need to live that way forever, but that makes the the goal of getting to the show with something meaningful more manageable. You're not giving up on the big goal, but you're you're turning something into into an experience that you can see how it shoots, give a little bit of fun feedback, and then you know hopefully yeah, learn and, more. And you also see the difference like the. I'm I'm not like I don't catch the ball and and plan my shots like a lot of people do. I I'm just like a kinetic thing kind of like I just keep keep batting the thing around. And then you watch people as they're trying to play this game and they're like holding the ball and they're planning their shots and I I get to see how people how other people approach the game. It's interesting to learn that way. Yeah, the different types of players and the yeah. approach I could definitely see that. I remember like from the early days um at the first show you described when you brought us the Whitewood I believe it was you and I talking, like standing over it and watching the the dirty trails on the white wood of like oh, the yeah, shots that were yeah. most popular. So I I brought it to the show without any artwork for the first few years, and then when I finally got to the stage where I wanted to do the artwork, I had to strip everything off. Yeah. Because I needed I didn't I didn't see and see the thing. I did it all by hand, uh, and so then I had to get an actual image of the playfield before we could do the artwork that matched it. Yeah. So I'd taken everything off, and then you could see these. The, the dirty trails around everything is. I hope you still have that, like framed on the wall. Oh yeah, 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 you know? yeah. They've got a lot of pictures of it over the years, for sure. Sweet. Yeah. Well, thanks and for a, thanks for coming out. Man. Oh, and another, another thing. Wait, too, one more like, story. Uh, yeah, well, it's not that important. No, it's tell just me. like, uh, <laughs> uh, you you really need feedback um, for um, when, when people are batting things around. Even if your your switches don't score or, or do whatever, mm -hmm. they have to make some noise or something like that. You have to have that feedback. Yeah, people have to feel like they're doing something all the but, time. I think that's uh, that's a good point. I mean, when you look at like all the grand vision of what you want it to be when it's revealed, the pinball experience is really an iterative thing too. So if you add stuff in and get people loving it and getting a good taste of things, and then just keep adding, yeah. you know, it's good yeah, stuff. for sure. Thanks for coming out, okay. man. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lynn, paging Lynn. Sorry, uh, it'll take a second. We're counting up all the games he's been working on. Uh, Shoot. <laughs> okay, so a quick personal story here. Um, when I first got into pinball, fast pinball, and all the stuff we were doing, um, you know, there weren't that many people making homebrew games back then. And so Lynn was one of the people that was making his own pinball machine. Everyone else was smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, like, we ended up on the phone. That's how old school this was. It's like on the phone, like, Dishing about like homebrew pinball and stuff, and it was iPhone so... three on my side. Wait, what? I no iPhone four, iPhone first version from Verizon. You're aging us out, man. Yeah. But we didn't get to get together in person until three years ago here. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the kind of thing that like we were connected initially over homebrew, but then getting together in person. Now, I mean, I'm guaranteed to see Lynn anytime we come to this show, and um, if the show is remote, like fantastic, I get fun late night. Video calls coming in from people who are enjoying themselves at a pinball show late at night make me jealous that I'm not actually there. Mm -hmm. So, um, Lynn, you, you've taken um, a variety of approaches at making your games. So it's not just yeah. traditional pinball, but also your pinball AR adding in that layer that adds that additional depth. So talk a little bit about that so that people can get an idea of what that approach is in, in your games. Hmm. Um, so I'm a video game programmer by day. So I already knew a lot of visual, like cause, effect, game, immediate type stuff, right? And uh, when I first started doing the pinball stuff, it actually was because I was working on a, a PS3 game called uh, Pinballistic. And that came out in uh, 2011 after three years of not very good development. And um, But during that time... I I didn't know much about pinball. Like when I was young, I was an arcade guy. I collected arcade games all the time, and so I need to needed to learn like what is this pinball? Why w w am I doing more than just shooting a shot? Or is is there something more to it? Right. So there was a monster mini golf nearby that we would all go to, and it had at the time the easiest game in the world to learn, Simpsons Pinball Party. And so that's how I learned rules. And so when you play some of my games, you'll see. Um, it eventually I, I, I kind of figured out the way to make like Mark said easy shots for some people and harder shots for if you think about if you want to focus um, but some, something like Contra Cruz I have a two ball multi ball similar to what Mark did where you hit a couple shots you can start a twin sisters 
But if you want to stack all four multi-balls, you need to hit 160 shots in the exact order, and then you can stack them all. Um, no one's ever done it. Who's got time for that? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's for the Owens and the Bowens, right? There you go. Um, so that that's kind of like a little bit of my history on it. And the the AR is... It, it just makes the sense. the technology part of it, the, the AR side of it. Like I mean, what they when they walk up there and look at so, it. So um, the idea with the AR is now that we have computers the size of your fist that can do things the equivalent of like a PlayStation 2 or something, we can actually do proper texture-lit polygons and animations and cause effect, which the original Pinball 2000 just couldn't do. Everything was pre-rendered, and it, it was great for the time, but it was way, way, way too early for what really could be done. But now that we have this technology, I'm like, hey... Why not just have this set and just dress it with different things um, and really add in more atmosphere and things? And I just like adding atmosphere. Well, it adds that depth, too, because a lot of the way you describe the games you're working on, it's like there's a story to it. You know, yeah. What is this experience that's having there? So yeah. I know, create experiences. Yeah, wonderful experiences. Yeah. Unless it's Christmas, then I create something quick because I want to do something before the season ends. But so, but but I think that's the thing is like you know pinball is like you know I always describe it as like a theater stage you know we know that we're not actually like in space or like you know you know whatever it is we're not maybe um, are we here who are you I don't know but I but I think that like you know the idea of the feedback that we give and the and the art dress and all that stuff and the animations and everything that go with it we're trying to take the player there and what's really interesting with with the AR stuff that he's done, doing with the overlays mm -hmm. is it adds that additional layer where as you're playing and you're hitting the shots and you're getting to know those things that additional aesthetic that placed over the top of it takes you even deeper into that experience it does i mean there's a lot of drawbacks with it like with with any technology um the ar stuff is on top of you so you can't be on top of it per se so you you can't like put a rug and and go on the rug because the rug will be above you Right, so instead you'd have to have like a little mound as the ball goes through the rug if you can detect the ball in the rug and it's the pain in the ass. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> but it still gives you like if you have walls that you can't go by, it can prevent. It can make the walls um, look different as like as you want. Yeah, yeah. Like well, do something. doors, frames, uh, sculpts. You can have statues do things if you want statues. You could you can have large uh, set pieces like a gargoyle come out and start fighting you and do things and his hand happens to be on that drop target so if you go into that drop target he can then virtually grab the ball throw it somewhere else and you pop out of the pop or someplace else Very right cool. um and yeah you just gotta it, the trick is uh, with a lot of pinball machines that i know of you do a lot of play field design you figure out the play field make sure it works right with an idea of what the theme is more mm -hmm. or less but with uh, the AR type stuff, you really need to get a good game design doc ahead of time to know exactly yeah. what you're going to be doing, what you plan on do, and then figure out, all right, how can I fit this into where the screen works? Because the screen only works in a certain section, right? Um, and you can't fit everything in, so what's the most important things to do? What do you have to take out? And then, you know, or it's an organic doc document, and you just change it as time goes on. And eventually something maybe good happens. Well, I would say too that like, you know, Lynn's in the category of, of homebrew pinball makers. It's like the rapid fire, like you know, yeah. the number of games that he produces. And what's really I made cool, three this year. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I grabbed a couple more photos on here. So here's a couple of the AR ones. Uh, the Haunted Cruise has been, that's... that's that, was, that was one of the longer running ones. Yeah. Um, it's not the oldest one. The oldest one, I still have a white wood at my shop. It's so Fairy the, Land Tales. So there's, there's Haunted Cruise, Magic Forest, uh, Frozen, and then... Um, Christmas. Yeah, Christmas, uh, but Christmas that's countdown. not a, uh, that's not. Wait, that Well, works. it uses my platform. It just sure. it has a different head. So my my cabinet supports two different heads depending on what I plug in and, and screw in. They, if you look closely, there would be two holes on each side of the cabinets. But the Christmas game, let's talk about that real quick. That was one that you were doing like online streaming the process. Yeah, so after way through. after Expo last year, um, November 1st, I started designing this from a blank page and I streamed all of this on the Facebook homebrew group. Eventually I'm going to get all this stuff on YouTube. It's it's on the backlog. Yeah. Um, and uh, between uh, November through December, I designed this thing soup to nuts. And I had a play field all, basically all put together. It wasn't in a cabinet. I didn't have the cabinet at the time because it just took a little while to get the play field printed and everything. But that's the very first white wood cut. I put some paper on it and I have videos of it and it worked. And I said, all right, screw it. Let's just put art on it. Well, uh, I mean, I, th I think that we could go on and on about all the things you do all the time. But I think that it's going to be worth coming down. He's got his own tented-off area 
with all the yeah. projects in there. And this guy is like constantly building things that make you walk in and wonder like, how did you even do this? And how did you find the time for this? You have family, you have jobs. I mean, it's, it's impressive. So be inspired by the work that he does. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, so so Chris Dana couldn't be here today. Um, we were really eager to get as many homebrews as we could here. So on my massive journey, I swung by Chris's place and said, can I take a couple of your homebrew games? Unfortunately, like in the process, we had some damage to, to the hopped up game. Um, so that one hasn't been running over here. But Green Out, um, if you've ever wanted to play a homebrew where you can shoot a bong, there's a bong in there that you can shoot. So it's... Uh, like Chris did a really great job, you know, with this design and um, some of the some of the little tricks and stuff like that worked in there. But he had a, had, a, had an idea for like what the artwork should look like. It should look like some some burnouts, like sitting in detention, like doing like sharpie or uh, like magic marker artwork and stuff like that. So if you get a chance, go over there and check it out. Um, it's 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 quite a package. Coleman. So some of these pictures I took are kind of these over the shoulder or trying to squeeze in between people because these games have people playing them the whole time. I, I have yet to play either of your games and I've been at multiple shows where Greek Gods has been there. So I think it's, uh, you know, you've been doing this stuff for a long time and I think that it's really cool to see the Adam game showed up, which again, like you walk up and you're like, what are they even doing to that thing? Is it like an air conditioner or like a popcorn machine? Um, talk about your quest in making pinball and what, we're, what people can come down and check out here. Pinball is kind of my uh, gateway drug to uh, get into uh, woodworking, uh, electronics, uh, welding, uh, Photoshop, uh, and uh, more 3D printing, uh, music. Uh, right. uh, and I uh, started with uh, Greek Gods in uh, 2017. Um, the uh, the Slack channel, huge help. Their Discord channel too. Um, they got me started got me thinking i thought well i'm only gonna make one game so i'm gonna like throw every single idea in there that i can uh and um uh with the help of my family my daughter doing the artwork my daughter doing the call outs my kids testing it saying hey you know this berry is really dull you need another mech here um after uh uh two and a half uh whitewoods uh had something that uh shot well enough to uh put some art on mm -hmm. um the uh and then along the way i thought um it would be really neat to have a, a mirror surface uh a pinball machine uh, and just and and you know have the the uh, reflection of the ball uh have the reflection of the play field and oh, maybe fine. i could use like one of these uh uh car wraps because you can get this chrome car wrap well i couldn't quite get that but i got this prismatic car wrap so uh i my idea is i'm just gonna make a little small a uh, piece of wood, pop bumpers, some flippers, and it's just going to beat the crap out of itself for um, uh, for two weeks, and I'll see if it can stand up. And so I start drafting that, and then, well, you know, actually this flipper can be kind of fun. Maybe I can just turn it into a little miniature game, yeah. and um, that's where Adam came from, uh, which is a little uh, a cocktail uh, pin, and to uh, iterate on it quickly, uh, I uh, 3D printed the, the, the whole thing, right. uh, except for the, the mechs and the, and the wood itself. Um, and uh, you'll come down and check them out. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's interesting the way that you have to like, like embrace it. You know, I think that's one of the things I thought was so cool. It's like, you look up there and it's like, does he need a hand? Like watching people hold this thing. But the idea that like you're coming in close, which requires you to kind of lean in and you're now you're looking down on yeah. the experience. So you're you're creating a, 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 a view perspective that requires you to be so close like that. So, you know, the the changes in form factors, that's something that like I really love. I love to see like, we all love the kinetic feedback of a fun toy that we can only experience in this location right now. And this one just changes the whole way that you engage with it. So. Where did that concept come from? Like, how did you get down to like, you know, you could have put those buttons anywhere, but to, to you got to get your arms around that. Like, talk about that. Um, it was a practicality of all of the okay. stuff I had to cram into the little case. Um, I used car speakers, which ended up being much deeper than I thought, which then limited where a bunch of stuff could go. Uh, and it, and uh, then since I was 3D printing the case, um, I uh, thought hexagons would be a, a logical shape okay. to be able to glue together. And where the seams landed uh, meant that the best place for the flipper buttons was you know, right underneath and um, forward to the, um, 
the speaker grill. Um, and, and then, then I thought, well, you know, you're kind of cozy there. That's, that's nice. Uh, you got the, you know, the speaker here. You're feeling the vibration. Oh, wait. The other speaker's actually, well, that's the wolf. Well, uh, I'm just, never mind. And, uh, it's a sensory experience. <laughs> it's a sensory experience. <laughs> it's, it, it, several people have now told me it, it's very intimate. <laughs> Well, you know, I think that's one of the things that's like getting together here and sharing experiences. Yeah. Now you've got a game you can share a very special experience with, you know. So, so I mean, like, I, I, form factor wise, I mean, like, even even the game, uh, even with Great Gods, you've got the lower play field in there. Like, when when you're when you dig into these things, like, is it first about like interesting shapes or introducing new features or like what what is kind of your prime driver when you're sitting down to design something like these? Um, light, color, and reflection, actually. Okay. Very cool. Um, and uh, I um, uh, tried to do lots of colorful things with uh, LED strips, ring LEDs on top of the pop bumpers. And this was all sort of, you know, really beginning to hit in the late 20 teens. Okay. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm really drawn towards that kind of color mixing. I did a class in college in, uh, uh, in optics okay. uh, in neuroscience. Um, and that was kind of what led me then into the, well, what would it be like to have a, 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 a mirror play field? Well, I mean, that's, that's, it's interesting that the, the things that we learn and we study and we bring in from other parts of our life. And I mean, everybody's got a different little like unique thing that they want to apply to pinball and hearing that the, you know, the color and, and, and the, and all that being the prime driver on this is like, that's yeah. really cool, man. And, and Tanner, because Tanner <laughs> shook me out of the Italian bottom <laughs> and got me thinking about what, these, these alternate form factors. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming down. Wait, hold, hold on. You got, you got some classes. Ah. Uh, oh. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Ed Owens, is he here? So I tried to track down Ed, like, um, as we were getting ready to do this, and I, yeah, he's busy nonstop, and then all of a sudden he's there, and you're talking pinball, and then he disappears. So Ed and I, we'd met a long time ago, many, did many ages ago at, at Expo, and I, we, he, I, I tell the story if he was here. He goes, you know, I walked into your homebrew booth and was like, what is all this? Like, none of these games work. Nothing's finished and stuff. And so many years later at Expo, we were able to reconnect and see now that, like, a lot of these projects that people were working on have come all the way along. And then to be able to hear some of the ideas and things like that that he eventually wants to introduce in, in the next games he does, um, it's been very cool to meet him. So, all right, Joel Kaiser. Come on down. <laughs> so for those of you who followed along or maybe didn't so joel and i we drove out together from the west coast so i drove down from the seattle area met joel at his place we crashed we got up in the morning had some coffee loaded the trailer up with his game and took off so uh joel i know that uh these kinds of talks are not your favorite i, I love talking <laughs> um we didn't meet in person until we were at the, the Northwest Pinball Show. Wait, can we backtrack a little bit? We can do whatever you want. Aaron won a major award for our trip. Oh. Do you have that award with I you? I don't have it with oh, me. So I, okay, well, here we go. I walked into his house and I got presented with a plaque that had like engraved like names and all that stuff on it. And that's, I'm, I feel like that's the new road trip standard. Anytime we get on the road now, it has to include a commemorative plaque. Correct. Okay. <laughs> there is also one for whoever gets the highest score for the entire weekend. Yeah, I'll have to go pull it out of the trailer because I think it's something people need to see. It's a, it's, it's a full dress award. All right, we have to make this a crazy, fast Boys Night Out interview because I really have to pee. <laughs> okay. Um, if, you're, if you're not in on the joke, we have Captain Crazy's Paradise. I don't know, the camera can't see it. And then we have Fast Pinball, <laughs> and I'm Boys Night Out. So crazy, fast Boys Night Out interview. See what we did there? So and if you're thinking all the pinball makers are awkward introverts, that's not true. <laughs> so I had I had not met Joel until he showed up at our Northwest Pinball Show with the first iteration of Boys Night Out. And Stan, uh, having that first experience with the game, like with the creator right next to them, um, is teaching me how to shoot these shots. And I was like very successful shooting these shots that were creative and, and different. Now this game, this version of Boys Night Out is the next turn of the whole thing. It's in a full art package. Um, all, the, all the shots and, and, and wireforms are, are revised 
and tuned up a bit. Um, why don't you talk about the process of going from your first iteration that you took around, had people playing, oh, and that's, how it got to that's this one? That's so boring. Nobody wants to learn about that. But uh, this is number five that I'm on, and then uh, there'll just be another one, tighten up some stuff. But uh, come play it. Come check it out. I might talk to you if you're lucky. Um, I might I might give you uh, some swag, too. Who knows? I, I think that uh, I think Joel needs to use the potty. So... <laughs> Thank you very much for coming down. I uh, I graduated today, so thank you. So, all right. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for coming down. <laughs> okay. Is Ryan here? <laughs> I think we're, we're, we're telepathing in our shiny domes back and forth. So... So I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell a story about Ryan because he's walking the long way around here. So... Um, we ended up at uh, Ryan's place of work, like Brian Madden and I, and we walk into a room where he's busy working, and, oh, buddy. <laughs> and so Brian had never met Ryan before, but we walk in this room, and he turns around and goes, oh, my gosh, these are the guys that got me into pinball. And Brian is like, who is this guy? And then eventually we were able to you know, tie it all back together, the Sonic's pinball game, running MPF, all that good stuff. So, you know, I think that um, – yep. I think. Yup. Yeah, that's it. Okay. That's my, that's so my I think right that, you know, Ryan, you, you, you went through the whole process of creating your first homebrew game and shared that experience along the way. And so um, not only is it like a lot of work to make your homebrew game, but then also share that experience, stream that whole thing along. And it has its perks and benefits of doing it that way. Like talk about what that whole experience was for you and what the result was in the end. All right. So honestly, that's probably the part of, of the, the whole pinball making process that I miss the most. Uh, it was a happy slash awful accident that had like I started my pinball machine during COVID. Like we all were shut up in our houses for almost two years, depending on how careful you were. And like there were you, you had to find a way to deal with it. So um, I think the popularity of my homebrew actually lent itself to the fact that everyone happened to find themselves unexpectedly completely isolated and with no no human connection. So I chose to spend my two years in my basement building what I had been talking about building for the last year before that. Right. And I missed everyone. So I would just, I couldn't be with them and I couldn't invite them over. So all I would do is just, hey, this is what I worked on today. This is what I designed today. Just, here's some pictures. I want you all to see this. I would have invited you all over my house, but I can't. Right. So like, and the internet just has a larger reach than me being able to call my friends over to my house because I couldn't. They, they they lived not like 10 minutes down the street, but they can't. They haven't played my game, and I've been working on it for two years. So I loved that I was able to connect with people from all across the world. I was shipping T-shirts to Germany and France, and that blows my mind because, like, I, I – I don't know. I've I've only left the country like a couple of times, and yeah. I've certainly never been to Germany and France yet. I want to go, um, but just the amount that the, this project brought me yeah. together with a lot of other people and the connections that we felt it, it helped us feel so much less alone during COVID. And that's I, I miss it. That community part is a big deal. Whether it's virtually, I mean, there's people that I know through Homebrew Pinball that live all over the world, and we see each other once in a while at shows. But even there's some people that I've worked with for years and talked to on a regular basis that I've never actually been in the same room with before. So it's being wild. That's why I was so excited when I first saw you guys. I'm like, oh my god, I couldn't have done any of this without all everything you guys did before me. So well, then I, I find you as another human who looks exactly the same true. as me. Come so on, I clearly were the on. same. <laughs> but I, I, I do think that, you know, it, it is, um, and we're approaching the rapid fire mode of the show, so we're going to get moving more quickly because I want to get more people in. But I do well, think I do that, that, like, it was great to see you bring the game back in because I think a lot of people who had followed along um, who hadn't got to play it, who got to see That was like, the whole reason it's here. Um, I Because of the success of it, I was able to land a professional job, and so I've been working on nothing but that ever since. And uh, people have been saying to me, I never got a chance to play it. So we're like decided to bring it, and uh, I have no time to set it up, make it work, or watch it while we're here. So I and I'm now lucky it's enough. Mine. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> so have this wonderful partner who also loves the game and has been watching it and taking care of it the entire time I've been here. So uh, thank well, you, fantastic. Bree, for yeah. helping me so, so if much. Questions about Sonic? Come see me, and I would love to walk you through it. And so definitely not. Come play this game. Yeah, come play the game. 
man. Thanks so much for coming down. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, is, is, is Owen here? Oh, real quick. Can we thank these two? Can we thank Fast Pinball, Aaron, Marco Specialties, and Emoto for making this year's homebrew section unlike anything it's ever been before? It's 40 yeah. games, yeah. at least, good, good, good job, a world man. record, and the presentation is something at the next level it's never been before. Even last year was nothing compared to this. Thank you Let's both keep so much. The bar, you know? Okay, is Owen here? I wasn't able to track him down before we came up here, so come and check out the Pokemon game. Like, it's got cool flow, the shots are fun, and, and it's like one of those ones that, like, again, I still haven't gotten to play it. Everyone's standing, playing the game, and I get to look over their shoulder and want to play, so... Yeah. Okay. Jake, do you want to come up? Yay, Jake. Okay, so if you don't know Jake yet, uh, Jake runs the Strictly Customs Homebrew Collector Custom Pinball Group. I butchered the name. Something like that on Facebook. And so this is one of the areas where, like like I've said earlier, it, it's hard to keep track of every homebrew game that's going on anymore. But uh, this is a cheat sheet shortcut. And it's not just like the latest things going on, but he's mining the internet and the world for finding these projects and stuff like that that we may have forgotten all about and we get to see them fresh for the first time. So, Jake, talk a little bit about your your Duke's project and um and really like I mean you're like you're you bring a lot of people together. So, thank you for that too. You're welcome. Um <laughs> the Duke's pen, I've told this story many times. A lot of people here, I'm sure have heard it, but it was really a team effort. Yeah. And I did put a lot of my own work into it, but if I had a title, it would be project manager. Okay. So I am proud of it. It's an absolute dream theme for me. Uh, like I've always told everybody, the, the reason I made it is because Bally never did make one back in the day. Right. So I had to do it myself. So do you aspire to do it again? Do you have a next project you want to do? Next project is in the works right now. Very cool. Yeah. So uh, so when do, when do you think you're going to get to that? Like, is I it, uh, you're seeing it at Expo next year, like TPF? Like, do you, have you set yourself a goal out there that you're aiming for? Uh, the latest goal will be Expo next year, Very cool. if, if not sooner, but I'm shooting for Expo next year. Well, I think that also, too, even as you've been here, you know, connecting with new people like in the programming side of things, like, you know, there's a lot of people in the homebrew community that don't even have their own projects going yet, but have made the effort. Um, Alex Abasco had came, come out to the show this year and just to be here to help out, you know, on the software side of things. Debugging at a show is a nightmare when I think about it. The idea of like debugging code and working with crappy Wi-Fi and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was very cool. I mean, not, Sorry, it wasn't cool that you had an issue with your software, but it was cool that he was able to jump in yeah. and lend a hand and make that connection. Too. Absolutely. So. And that's something I'd like to say is I'm big into pinball, I'm big into custom pinball, but more more importantly, I'm big into building the community. Absolutely. So we, we started that Facebook group, Strictly Custom Pinball Machines, somewhere around seven years ago. Yeah. I've mentioned it many times. I really thought it would never have more than a few hundred people Mostly my friends that only jumped in because I invited them. As of right now, we're less than 200 members away from 10,000 people. That's incredible. So it's uh, it blows my mind, and uh, thankfully I don't have to do all of the work anymore. A lot of people are posting their own games, yeah. their own prog progress, and I'm just as fascinated about it uh, as anybody else. Dude, that's awesome. Oh. So because we're in the rapid fire mode, like we're, we're going to give you this this tag here and we're going to thank oh. you for everything that you're doing oh. for the homebrew community. And uh, come down and play Dukes of Hazard and you meet Jake. You spelled my name wrong. I didn't do it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dude, thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Jeffrey and Lisa Sue, you got to come on down. Like... And we're getting down to the wire here, so if we don't get to everybody, like, please come out. I will come and do this in front of their game, and we can have this whole experience and uh, and rah-rah these projects. But Jeffrey and Lisa Sue, this one, I love this story because two years ago at this show, they came out to meet us and talk about, like, how realistic it is to make a homebrew pinball machine. So two minutes – or, sorry, two years ago is where they started, and come check out Greatest Showman um, – Talk a little bit about this project. Like, this is a, a, a collaboration between the two of you, the division of responsibilities and stuff like that. We've got to witness that and, and see it come to life. So, I would guess around four years ago, my wife, we started seeing the homebrews and she said, You should make a greatest showman pinball machine. And 
I had no interest at all, none. <laughs> I said, I restore pinball machines. I can make one look beautiful, but I don't code. I don't have time to learn how to code. So about three years ago, we saw more homebrew machines, and she says, you should make a Greatest <laughs> Showman pinball machine. <laughs> and again, I said, I have no interest. I don't have time to learn how to code. So two years ago, yep. we're talking to Erin. And she's getting excited. She's like, we can do this. Uh, I said, I have no interest. I don't know how to code. And she said, if you make the game, I'll learn how to code. Yeah. So that's Woo! what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and watching that process, like we, we have a private Slack channel of all the users that are building and making the games. And watching you come in and be like, I don't know what I'm doing here. But then the questions get more clear. The help and support is, is helping you move the project along. Like. It's been very incredible seeing how quickly you went from like never having programmed pinball machines to actually having a game here that's that looks fantastic. Yeah, I had never written a line of code until June. That's amazing. And like, I'd like to make sure everybody knows I'm a nurse practitioner who likes to sew. I am not a coder. <laughs> well, you can't say that anymore. You are a coder now. You have coded a pinball machine. And again, we're running out of time here, but like I want you to come down and see these games. It's it's in the same booth with the saw. Uh, game down there, and it's 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 fantastic. Thank so you. Thank, thank you so much thank for coming you. out and hanging out with us. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> right. So we're running out of time. So uh, let's bring everybody up and just like hand out some certificates, put faces with names, and associate with the games, and um, and we'll roll with that. Okay. Yeah, so all, all the other all the other homebrewers, I think we're I think they're pushing us out now. So we got to go over here and do a group photo, and then everybody else come down and see these games. And like I said, I will tour you around to see all the ones that we didn't get to talk about here. But thank you guys so much for coming out, and uh, you should make some homebrew pinball. Yeah.